uh, we did a call. We did a call last time. Uh, the audio and the quality wasn't that great, so now we're redoing it, and um, we're gonna see how this goes. So, Matt, uh, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Raw Matt. I've been going by this nickname now for probably uh, 15 years. And uh, I got into the raw food movement a long time ago, probably in 2001 or two, I'm not sure exactly when. It was introduced by a guy named Jacob Hopkins. He invented the goji bar and he came by and noticed what I was eating and was absolutely disgusted by it. So he made some derogatory comment and I just said, okay, well, what should I be eating? And he gave me the most peculiar answer I've ever been given, just eat fruit. I didn't even know how to react to this comment. I thought I was on candid camera or something. I was looking around like, what are you talking about? Just fruit. Like I've eaten blueberries before and I'm like hungry an hour later. I couldn't even, anyway, my mind couldn't grasp it. And I, I after he, he stayed and he kept pressuring me and talking to me about like what I should be doing about this fruit thing. I said, okay, you know what? I'll give it a shot. It sounds fascinating. At the time, I was a professional fighter, and that's all I was doing. So if it was actually going to improve my physical abilities, then I was all for it. It didn't matter the ethical side. He was more mad at what I was eating. See, he was a vegan. So he was mad that my roast beef sandwich had blood dripping out. That's probably what started the conversation, now looking back in retrospect. And uh, so what I did is I, I jumped right on it, and I noticed an immediate improvement. And I couldn't believe it because I had already really good cardiovascular, but it went so far out the window that I actually competed in a triathlon for no reason at all. Somebody invited me and said, hey, do you want to compete? There's a triathlon going around Lake Cahuilla. I hadn't trained for it and I've never done one. I said, sure. I had a little dirt bike. <laughs> That's all I had, a mongoose dirt bike from Target. And uh, these people have these professional bikes. And I, was, I didn't have any idea, right? So I jump in the water and I'm swimming. I got board shorts on. Everyone has these spandex wetsuits and they're greased up. They got these head things on. Anyway, I did really good. And I can't believe it. Out of a thousand people, I actually placed in the top 100. So I knew something was going on. So I, I did it for my physical thing first. And then I started to investigate. I really wanted to learn the science of everything, right? So I started studying and I started learning about plant alkaloids and terrapenes and glycosides, tannins, phytonutrients. And then I realized, wow, there's a lot going on here. Let, let's figure out what diet is going to make us live the longest. Which one is the best for longevity? Because I'm, you can convince some people, sure, that you probably shouldn't eat meat for an ethical reason, but they're, they're probably going to start a diet that's going to take them down a path where they're going to crash and burn because they never ate for health. You know what I mean? They just ate because it tasted good and it's not an animal product. So even though they may want to stay a vegan after a few years, they end up hurting their health. So I say to everybody that health should be first. It should be the number one reason that you're doing it. And everything else is secondary because you can be a vegan. But if your priority is your own health, then you'll actually be able to remain a vegan. Because if you actually look at the number of people that are plant based and the failures, it's not because their ethics changed. It's not because of their mindset. It's because they physically failed at their capacity to follow the program and succeed at what they're doing, right? Their mental cognition started failing, their physical ability started failing, they got uh, iron deficiency or B12, something happened to them where they completely failed. So why do some people succeed and why do some fail? We can get into that a little bit later, but since there's so many questions, I say we'll dive into that first and then we can move to that because uh, I really want people to succeed. And to succeed means you have to stave off everything that has to do with aging and disease and problems and diet is the ultimate way to do that everybody thinks it's uh, exercise but it's called diet and exercise diet always comes first it's your base foundation it's what's going to really help you succeed and i think that everybody once they get a little bit of a foundation on understanding of what to do they can they can take off from there and say okay now i don't have to worry about anything i know my health will be good and when you start to look at around the world and see that the plant-based eaters outlast the meat eating sort uh you know groups of people you you go okay i shouldn't fail at this so why am i why are other people failing and then you can realize that oh that's what's going on i'm following the the norm i'm following what everybody else is doing when i eat plant-based and that's why it's failing me so 
Awesome. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction there. Um, so I guess like one question that I guess it might have to do with that is the first question on the page that I have from somebody that I asked. Um, it says, what, what's your general macro balance between protein, carbs, and fats? Good question. So that usually comes down to what you're doing, your physical activity level. Are you, are you sitting in an office typing all day? Because if so, your protein should be very, very low, probably less than 10%. Doesn't ever need to go above that. Uh, Walter uh, Kempner actually showed that with the rice diet, where a long time ago, he took groups of people and he said, come into my office and I'm going to put you on all rice for the next, uh, you know, three weeks. We're going to and then come back and I want to test everything that's going on. They did. They came back in three weeks and uh, he goes, you know what? He tested their nitrogen balance, which is in your urine. And if your nitrogen ratios are imbalanced you can actually tell if you have too much protein in your diet or not enough we actually even do this today as professional um you know as, as trainers so you can go to a trainer at a gym and they'll test your nitrogen balance to see if you need more protein in the diet well this was just to the average public and he noticed that their protein content was still too high on white rice so what he did is he added sugar to it regular table sugar and this table sugar lowered the protein content in half and then he said, come back in three more weeks. They did. Their vitals were even better. So by knocking protein content down, the lower he got protein, the healthier the general public became. So I usually tell people, if you're just an average human being, you don't need to be consuming a lot of protein. And the reason why, you can look up you know, vitamin deficiencies and you'll see B6 is always one of the top vitamin deficiencies that you look at, no matter where you go in the world. Um, mostly in America. Why? Because America has the highest protein content and B6 is the protein vitamin. It's what helps break down excess protein. So there's so much protein in the diet, there's not enough B6, you end up getting a B6 deficiency because of that. So think about this for a second. Why would America have a B6 deficiency and a B12 deficiency? They're eating the highest amount of protein, but they're also eating meat, which has B12 in it, yet they have the highest deficiencies of both of those. So their very diet is causing them deficiencies and they don't even realize it. So it's not the protein that's the problem. Protein is something for an athlete. And the more of exercise you get, yes, the more you're going to require uh, the protein because you're gonna have to keep that positive nitrogen balance. You're gonna have to keep the amino acid ratio coming in and, and, and to rebuild your body. You're gonna have to get rid of the lactic acid that's building up in the muscle tissue. So therefore that person should probably be taking around 20 grams every few hours because you can't really digest more than that so it seems to be kind of wasted unless you're on a one meal a day type of thing then yeah you probably want to cram a lot in during that one window it'll be a little bit hard but it's not anything that's impossible you can do it it's just it's let's just say it's much harder on a raw food diet than it would be on a vegan or a regular diet right yeah right. no that's something i see it's a little echoing. Do you think you could turn the volume down a little bit on your side? I don't know if that might be it. Is it still echoing? I think it's a little better. Oh, I don't hear myself anymore. Okay, cool. Okay, okay. good. But yeah, so something, yeah, a lot of people, they think like, oh, I got to get more protein or, or, but if you don't need it, then there's no point, right? So unless unless you're actually doing like exercise like you were talking about or you're like an athlete then you need more like percentage or like um, but yeah it's like it, you're getting enough protein already as long as like eating a wide enough variety in and out, in and out, in and out. Yes, exactly. I tell people eat as much carbs as you possibly can from every source. The it's, it comes down to calories. So if you're worried about, oh man, I'm not getting my natural fats, don't worry about it. Your body makes fat, and it makes fat in the perfect ratio as well. So fats actually make you sluggish. So if you are an athlete, the more fats and oils that you put on food, you're going to feel very lethargic and tired from having heavy amounts of fat. So you don't want to replace carbohydrates with fat because it won't be very functional for your athletic performance. You can have fats later at night after you've done your training, but you definitely can't have it throughout your day. Fats actually slow you down. So I always recommend higher carbohydrates. Those tend to be the absolute best down the line, no matter what I recognize and no matter what people are, where they live, carbohydrates seem to do the absolute best. Cool. So like have your fats and the heavier stuff like later at night, probably, right? Or yes. Like your last stuff 
It lasts me all. Right, well, exactly. So for like, I guess for a ratio, I would tell people probably if you're an, a, a high end athlete, you could probably get away with like, you know, 65% from carbohydrates, maybe 20 to 25% protein, you know, and the rest in fat that could, that could probably do you good. That's probably the best ratio. And then would you say like more carbs if you're going to do like more cardio or? Uh, yeah, cardio is real simple. There's not a lot of muscle breakdown coming from that. And you're going to want more carbohydrates because by, by doing a lot of cardiovascular, you're causing a lot of more free radical damage because you're breathing in more oxygen. And oxygen is a damager, right? Because it's basically a, a, a bond, a hydrogen bond, basically, that are go, going back and forth and they hit each other and they break. That's what causes a free radical now going around in your body. Water can never be that way. It's bound. It looks like those Mickey Mouse ears are actually touching each other. So they can actually never become a free radical. So the more oxygen you breathe in, the more risk of free radicals you have. Therefore, you need more antioxidants and antioxidants are found in carbohydrates. They're not found in protein and fat sources into really any high extent. They're mostly found in carb sources. So by eating a lot of fruits, you can get away with doing a lot more damage to your body because it'll be more protected from all that extra oxygen you're breathing from from the long distance running. So carbs are even better for that as well. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um. So this one is more of like a, it's like a personal thing for you. Uh, it's a question. It's what does your diet and lifestyle look like right now at this point? Like since you've been raw for like 20 years, right? Um, yeah. So, and, and uh, how do you want it to evolve? Like, how do you want your diet to evolve over time? So over the, the next like five or 10 years? And then what has your detox journey been like? And then, uh, as an example, he's asking about like the time frames for cleanses and uh, things like parasite cleanse and protocols. Okay. Sorry, I had to turn you up there. I had you so far down. Um, so when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. So I became a monofruitarian. That's a person that eats just one type of fruit every month or whatever's in season. So I did that for quite some time for about maybe two years and then I dropped it and I noticed that kind of hunger went away. You can, you can get away without eating quite easily. So because I knew about caloric restriction but I didn't know how it worked, I just kind of snacked a little bit throughout the day or I would make a drink and I would fill it with like room temperature water and then I'd put some raw honey in and then I would shake it up real good until because it mixes better at room temperature and then I'd refrigerate it. And then at noon, it was nice and cold and I would put a tablespoon of spirulina in there or two and I'd shake it up and then I would drink that. And that was like literally my meal almost every day. I was winging myself off of food and everything for as much as I could. Now, I don't really regret that because nothing like really detrimental happened to me. But what I did do is remember our hormones are, are regulated. There are what tell us we're hungry. What gauges if we're going to be hungry or not is a hormone called ghrelin. Think of like your stomach growling. So it's ghrelin, right? So this hormone regulates if we're going to be hungry or not. So I had basically robbed mine. I, I, it was, I messed that hormone up. Let's just say that. So I couldn't even distinguish when I was hungry or not. So I would set alarms to tell me like, oh, I should probably do something. So that wasn't good. So definitely don't want to like try to wing yourself off everything because eventually what you're going to do is you're going to, you're not going to have a muscle on your body left anymore. It's just going to, it's just going to be gone. You're not going to be able to hold on to anything because there's nothing anabolic coming in. Like what's anabolic about a tablespoon of spirulina and honey? There's nothing, right? So I lost all of my muscle and my size that took me years to earn. I lost it in like four months <laughs> and I was being physical too. Like I'm still, at the time I was actually working in Las Vegas at, a, at a Whole Foods and I was setting up their thing and I was a raw food chef at, uh, at Rainbow's Inn Natural Foods in Vegas as well. So I had two jobs that I was working. I wasn't eating and I was going home and I was being physical, I was working out. So it was just, a, it was kind of a disaster. I wasn't competing at the time, so it really didn't matter. And then what happened is I got back onto eating a little bit more fruits. And then I go, you know, I'm gonna try the gourmet thing. So I started making kinds of raw pizzas, you know what I mean, with flax seeds and chia seeds. And then I'd, and then I'd stuff it with all kinds of tomatoes and pour dressings inside and then dehydrate that and make all kinds of really high-end gourmet foods. 
that was fun, but I kind of burned out on it. You know what I mean? Like I invented the kale chip, for example, that everybody loves today. And the original kale chip was good. Um, I'm just, you know, you can only eat so much kale chips before you're burned out. And again, it's another really light food. And I was trying to practice caloric restriction. And then I learned it's not about snacking all day long. The trick is dividing your meals up into huge portions, very, very infrequent. The reason why is because every time you take a drink of something that's sugary or any time you spike insulin, what's happening is you're stopping those metabolic processes of your liver to function. And that's what we need to function the best. So by snacking, you prevent that. So I stopped all my snacking and then I learned it's about mass portion eating as infrequently as possible. So that's what I practice now. And I would say that um, some of my favorite protocols were actually the ones that were harder. And now I really don't like them. Like the calcification one is very, very hard. A parasite one, you gotta be very on top of it because if you miss if you miss a few days, it's not such a big deal. So it's a good, good one to like push you to the really hard ones like the calcification cleanse. That's really hard. You can't miss a day. Let's say a Lyme disease. That one's so hard that you literally can't even miss one time of day with your multiple cleanses during the day because it's a pleomorphic disease that changes with your microbiome. So if, if you're consuming your medicine and you just skip it, well, guess what? That pleomorphic, that changing microbe that's in your body is going to change its shape and now your, your, your medicine won't fix you anymore. So you have to start with ones that are a little bit easier. So I usually tell people, do a heavy metal cleanse. But don't just go and get cilantro and drink it down. You know, don't do like your typical simple ones. I recommend people take hawthorn uh, leaf and stem and, you know, flower. Those are the best. Those really get rid of things. Take milk thistle seed all the time, even in capsule form. I don't care. However you can get it into your body, like an herbal tea, capsule form, tincture form, take milk thistle and sun chlorella. Those are the three that you need. Those are like the absolute best because they have the capacity to reach out and, and grab onto this rare heme iron that's storing in the male liver. It's grabbing onto the nickel and cadmium. And cadmium is in a lot of people because they eat so many vegetables, especially on a plant-based diet. A lot of people eat vegetables. You gotta be careful because cadmium is a heavy metal that stores into the soil and plants are designed to pull metals into themselves. They don't distinguish between good and bad because people aren't supposed to eat them. That's for animals, right? Well, animals have more than one stomach usually, right? Especially green, plant, veg vegetarians. So they can break down and they can handle these heavy metals because there's a lot more processing going on and they can exfoliate and get rid of it. Humans don't, we end up storing it into our fat and we can't get rid of it very good. So you're gonna need something to boost that. So I usually start people on a heavy metal cleanse and then a liver cleanse following it up. And uh, what will happen then is, um, you ever heard of the term detox? That word exists because it usually comes from something that makes people feel bad. And the reason it makes you feel bad is because we store toxins in our fat. And the more fat we lose and the cleaner our fat dumps these toxins to our bloodstream, the sicker we get. That's why a lot of people, when they, you hear about them getting lost on a deserted island and they find them like just three weeks later and they're dead, how is that possible? Well, it's impossible that they died from starvation. And I'll tell you why, because even if there was no food on the island, anybody should be able to fast for three weeks on water, right? So what made them die? They obviously didn't die from starvation because most people are overweight. They died because their body, their fat was so full of toxins that when they started losing weight really, really quickly, those toxins dumped into their bloodstream. They became very, very sick. Their liver probably couldn't handle it. They died from toxicity. They didn't die from starvation. And that's most people today. So you don't want to lose a lot of weight really quickly on a cleanse. You, don't, you have to be cautious of what you're doing. You have to lose weight kind of slow or you have to be exercising while you do it because exercising will make you lose it faster it'll help you you know cleanse those toxins out of your bloodstream quicker they'll 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 just get out so usually when people start to feel bad you got to exercise you got to move around and you got to take the things that help and they buffer your liver so you know heavy metal cleanse then a liver cleanse then a parasite cleanse then you know uh, it depends on what you want to do at that point but uh, usually, assume you have parasites and every five to 10 years, do a really good cleanse and every 10 years, do a calcification cleanse. And the reason why is because calcification is a much slower builder up. And as it builds up, you knock it all the way back down and you don't have to worry about it again for another 10 years. But if you neglect it and you neglect it all the time, you're gonna have huge problems later on down in your life and you won't be able to do anything about it because there's gonna be so much calcium phosphate built up in between the joints that it'll never be able to be broken up without 
topical three megahertz ultrasound machine and nobody's wanna, gonna wanna dump a thousand dollars on one. So just be smart and assume that every problem that can happen to people around you can also happen to you and you'll be on the safe side and you won't have any regrets looking back because this is about longevity, remember? So diet is just one aspect and one part of it. Yeah. So you were mentioning how there is like lots of heavy metals or like the cadmium inside of greens or was that the vegetables or both, right? No, what was the first part did you say? You said there's like heavy metals or yeah. such as like cadmium inside of um, the vegetables. Yeah, vegetables and what? What was the other in word? Greens. Greens. Oh yeah, in greens. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'll find um, you'll find cadmium usually in leaves and grasses. And most, most of the time, it's the vegetable sources. So a lot of people that like to go and buy a bunch of cabbage and kale and, you know, collard greens and throw them into a big ba uh, broth of, you know, pretty much anything that's a vegetable. Most people use mixed greens. All of those have small amounts of cadmium. And, they, and, it, and it only takes small amounts to constantly build up. I even tell people don't wear jewelry. The reason why is because even the metal from your ring gets into your bloodstream. So if something as small as a little ring on your finger can pull metals into your body, imagine, imagine that grinding that ring up onto your, the, the elements of the ground and then having a plant grow. It's good, eventually, it's going to be in that plant, and you're going to eat that ring rather than having it being absorbed. And that's not good. That's that's the opposite of what we want to go on. You know, we've got to be cautious of the things around us. You ever walk into a gym and you can smell the plastic off the weights? That's the parabens. You know what I mean? Those are those are chemicals that we're inhaling. It's the same with water. When we take a shower, there's heavy metals in that, too. You know, and then we turn it real hot. Well, now it's a vapor. So now you're inhaling it. It's coming through your skin, through your pores. It's coming in through your nose, into your brain. It's getting everywhere. So we can't just assume that we're safe and we're free from you know, we're free from everything now because we just eat fruit. We have to really be cautious. Fruit is very naturally detoxing on its own because it, it naturally is cl clathorative. So it's going to bind to a lot of toxins anyway. But it's still it's still not enough to get absolutely everything. You have to reach outside of that and do good cleanses, even if it's not raw. I don't care. It's cool. So if you don't so you don't recommend greens, right? I am I'm not against them. I just make sure that people know the, the danger that they're in by consuming them. Like, for example, if I consume a salad, I will. I'll go in at night and I'll be like, I want to just load up on calories. So what I'll do is uh, like lately, for example, I've, I've been training a lot. Right. I've been outside with mats and I've been having a neighbor come over. And we're fighting a lot. So what I do is I want more calories at night. So I'll take the cashews and I'll ferment them up and I'll make a cheese. And then I'll, and once it's nice and thick, I'll cut it up and I'll put it in a bowl of iceberg baby lettuce. Like you can't have less uh, cellulose than that. Like, um, but what do they find in most um, lettuce like that? Jet fuel, because planes fly over everywhere and they're dropping chemicals out of them, right? As jet, as the jet fuel dissipates, as it's being burned off, it falls back to earth and it gets on our soil. We water our plants with municipal water. Well, guess where that comes from? It's a huh. It's all like chemicals. So you're put it's on chemical soil. Then you water with chemical water. And now you have these things going into your body from being eaten. It's not it's something that we can't avoid. So I'm not going to be super like, oh, no, what am I going to do? I'm just going to say, OK, well, I'm going to mitigate the damage as much as possible. I'm going to eat as much fruit as possible. And when I eat greens, I'm going to make sure that I do a cleanse every so often. Real simple. You know, I'm not going to oh, just uh -huh. You know, if I am going to eat kale, I'm going to make sure that that kale is definitely not raw. I'm going to probably blend it, juice it, uh, ferment it, or most likely dehydrate it. The reason why is it's very high in cellulose, and we don't have to get into the other reasons not to consume it. There's plenty, but it's the high amount of cellulose that your liver can't, I mean, sorry, that your body can't process. The only reason we can digest it is because of the high hydrochloric acid of our stomach. And even then, you can see it in the toilet for most of the people, right? It's because they're not digesting it. So what's the point of eating it? Everything is about assimilation. So if you're not digesting the greens that you're eating, probably should stop eating them. Cool. So you recommend doing a, like a cleanse every once in a while, like like a heavy metal cleanse. And you said around five, five years, you said, or just when you're eating it more frequently? That, uh, no, I said the uh, parasite cleanse every five years, the calcium cleanse every 10 years, and the heavy metal cleanse should be every about uh, one to three. It just depends on your diet, you know, and it depends on where you live as well. Cool. So. Okay. I'll 
Okay, so if, say if like somebody was to eat greens, like if they were going to, like, what would you recommend them to eat if they were, if they really wanted to? Sure. Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, if you eat greens every single day, if you have a bowl and I was to recommend people like, okay, what kind of greens should I put in there? If this is daily, you probably want to avoid the cruciferous. The reason why is because they contain goitrogens. Ever seen people with the bumps underneath their skin, usually around their neck? Those are goiters. They, those occur because of cruciferous vegetables. So we're talking about bok choy, kale, broccoli, cabbage. We're talking about things that are not important to have every single day. You see, bodybuilders really like them. They like having broccoli because what happens is it boosts testosterone a little bit. So I usually tell people, make sure that it doesn't have the goitrogens in it. So I usually tell people consume maca. So if they're going to have a bowl of, of salad, make sure when you go and you go to the grocery store, you look around, you get the baby lettuces and you get the um, iceberg and you get the, what is it? There's another one that's not just regular iceberg. It is... Um, uh, there's another type of a green that's very similar to iceberg lettuce. And the reason it's important is because they have the lowest amount of cellulose. They have the lowest amount of heavy toxicity. Because remember, uh, plants are kind of like a fish. The longer they live, the more metals they're going to pull into them. And the, and the more a fish lives, the more mercury it's going to have in it. So you want to get it when it's a baby and you don't have those concentration problems. You don't get as much cellulose. You don't get as much adaptation. When plants grow, plants don't want to be eaten by animals. So they start building up high amounts of um, acid uh, you know, content. There are lots of nitrates, lots of tannins. That's why some are bitter. Some make your tongue go numb. These are the plant trying to protect itself. So you want baby greens. You want to get them in their infancy. Those are the best. And if you have them in a bowl, that's fine. Have them be your base. And then you can add things to them, really even to help them digest, you know, apple cider vinegar that really helps stimulate a bit more hydrochloric acid will help break those green downs. You can actually pour olive oil on them first and then let them set for a few hours before you eat them. That'll help break that, that, that plant cellulose down a little bit more because most people that are raw or vegan are actually just going to go to their fridge and they're going to dump their fresh greens straight from the bag into a bowl and they're going to eat it, right? They're not going to prep it anyway. So if you're going to do that, yeah, you have to use the baby greens. You're going to have to use the ones that are the lowest in cellulose. You're not going to want to use the, you know, the kales and the collard greens and the really heavy, heavy ones that are harder to digest. Yeah, you want to avoid those unless you can process them real quickly, but most people aren't. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I usually, if I do eat salad, it's it's usually not the like the heavy stuff like that. It's usually the easier to eat uh, way, like way, like you know. So you don't have to like, if you're chewing so much, like you got a question, like, are we really meant to eat that? I mean, I mean, fruit is this whole. It's totally different. Like you don't have to chew fruit much. Like you obviously you're gonna want to chew well to digest and have good digestion, anyways. But yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, think about it. Think about it. Why do we why are we able to see so much color? It's because we're designed to look for fruit. Why is our saliva amylase? It's for only breaking down carbohydrates. We don't make any other enzyme in our mouth to break down proteins or fats, right? They have to contain either uh, trypsin for protein or they better contain uh, lipase for fat or cellulase for cellulose. So if you break those down, you don't digest them very good. There's no real assimilation coming on from the food. So we have to get, but our mouth makes saliva. It makes it for carbohydrates because that's our natural diet. Cool. And just to clarify, like you don't say like, like just what you said already, you don't say do not eat greens ever. You just say make sure you're doing the proper cleansing and that you know what, it, what it's going to be coming with. Like, you know, you have the heavy metals in the salads and there's nothing to, you, you can't get around that basically. So you, you should be doing cleansing. Yes, exactly. If you're eating a lot of fruit, then you can um, you can get away with eating some other things. Obviously, for people that don't want to just eat fruit, that's fine. You're going to have some nuts and seeds some here. You're going to have some vegetables over here. You're going to have some flower pollen over here, some cactus over there, some seaweeds over there. You're, do you're going to have a lot of diversity in your diet anyway. So greens might be part of that, but they're not going to be your base. I definitely don't. They, they won't succeed. You know, that's why Daniel Vitalis failed. Daniel Vitalis' base was a kale salad every day. Why do you think he failed? It's, it's obvious. You know what I mean? You can't sustain on that. You just can't do it. It's not a longevity protocol. It's not a longevity program. Your body's not designed for that, so it's going to fail. It can't keep up. 
all the people that are going to succeed do high amounts of fruit or they do some gourmet thing. And it's never like a base of greens. There's no way. No possible way. Yeah, that Vic Victor guy, I think, yeah, I remember him. He's not like, he was never super high on the fruit either, right? So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they, they don't like it too much. They, they, they think fructose is really bad for you. And they think carbohydrates are, are overrated. They think that you should probably have more protein. They think the, the keto thing is the way to go. It's not. That leads into my next question because I know Brian Clement, I was watching videos of him and at, at their, uh, the um, what's it called? Brian Clement's, uh, it's like this place in Florida. It's this like healing place. But he talks about doing pretty much like little to no fruit, which I, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Like he says that the reason like he recommends little to no fruit because, because um, they found under the microscope that actually start growing from uh, sugar, no matter what it is, like fruit from it. But I don't know what your opinion on that is. Well, I'm a microscopist and I look at blood under a microscope. So you're asking the right person. What happens is when you take the average person and you start giving them fruit, for instance, oranges build fungus. If you eat oranges or drink orange juice, it will build fungus in your body. But why? Off of pre existing fungus swirlings that are already there. By the time you're clean, it can't grow. Oranges do nothing to my blood at all anymore. But when I started, oranges were horrible for fungus. So if you have ringworm or if you have dandruff and you go to, and I dare you, like I dare anybody, if you're, you can grab bananas and eat a couple bananas before bed if you have a fungal issue and watch how much worse your tongue is when you wake up in the morning and how bad your dandruff is. Stick your tongue out and look at that white coating. That's called thrush. And what that is, is that's bacteria building up your esophagus coming onto your tongue. That's how much backed up you are with bacteria. That's how much harmful bacteria you have. It means you have an overgrowth. There's an imbalance in your body. That's most people. They mostly have that. Matter of fact, most children have that now. Children are being bored with thrush. And when they do now, they just give you more antibiotics. Well, guess what? Yes, it kills the thrush, but it also kills the beneficial bacteria and they're at war with one another. So you knock all that bad bacteria down and good bacteria and your tongue clears up and they go, see, you got rid of it. Well, guess what? It's gonna come right back again the second you start eating because what's dairy? Dairy is lactose. What is lactose? It's a sugar. It's a dairy sugar. So you're feeding the fungus right back to your baby again. So they're doing it all wrong. Same thing with most people. They, you grab an average person and you put them on fruit. They're like, oh my gosh, look at all the fungus you're building. Yeah, they probably shouldn't be going to the grocery store, jumping right into like these hybrid sugary fruits off the grocery store shelf. This isn't gonna help them. You can't be giving somebody orange juice that's on a typical American diet, you know what I mean? That's not what's gonna heal them, but they don't know that. So it looks really bad when they start them because most people have a carbohydrate problem. That's why obesity exists. You know what I mean? It's mostly because of the, the simple sugars that are making them obese. And that's why Diet Coke is so popular, right? You go to McDonald's, it's all breads and carbohydrates and these things that are spiking. So then when they go to retreat and somebody gives them sugar and they see that the sugar doesn't do good in their blood, they attribute it to the fruit when it's the wrong attitude, right? It, it's the, it's, they're looking at it from the wrong perspective. And a natural, healthy person has no problem at all with that transition, and it won't build fungus whatsoever. Cool. So it's the disease that's already in them that was causing the problem. Um, so, yeah. okay, we can get to this at the end, but like, I guess at the end, like, you can talk about the fruits that you really recommend uh, to sure. stay away from because. I mean, there's fruit you can eat once in a while, but just not so like super like like a bunch of it, right? Like all the time. Like yeah. mangoes, 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 mangoes are just all like I know like people like their mono fruiting, like you were talking about in the beginning, like you used to do. You used to do a lot of mono fruit. And I think um, like I have seen a lot of fruitarians, like they aren't looking good. Like they're really they don't look good. but it's not to blame it on the fruit, it's just to blame it on they are doing right? Yeah, I notice um, some of the uh, some of them have a wrong mindset. One that comes to my mind right now is by the name of Raw Bliss, and what he does is his mindset is I need to lose every ounce of body fat that I have, and then I can rebuild. That's not how it works, people. 
we know that fat stores in our toxins, but you can cleanse that out while still having body fat. It's going to replace its other. It's like saying, I want new skin cells, so I'm going to rub my flesh off and have it regrow. That's a horrible idea. You don't rip your flesh off to grow new flesh. You let it replace itself. So what his mindset and his attitude is, is wasting his body away. He's destroying himself because the body can't tolerate what it's doing. So then he's trying to actually get fit and work out while consuming almost nothing but fruit here and there as he's walking through town. It's, the, it's why it's failing. And that looks and that reflects bad on everybody. You know, Durian Ryder did the same thing. He believed that he should just consume white sugar, for example, while riding a bike every single day and that you could just drink sugar water, basically, you know, just just have uh, pineapple juice and then ride your bike every day. That's going to fail. You know what I mean? That That's why he did fail, actually. That's why he invented these other diets, because his failed. He couldn't keep up with raw. There was no way he could. He failed. He crashed and burned. Then he invented raw until four. And then he failed with that because he couldn't keep up. Now he just wakes up and has a Sprite. <laughs> he said it's the same as fruit. No, a Sprite is not the same as fruit. That is the exact opposite. Any anybody can tell you that anybody on Earth should be able to tell you that a Sprite is not the same as an orange. Anyway, um, yeah, most people are, are doing the diet wrong because they, they don't really realize that there's what's going on comes down to trying to get in calories and trying to get in what their what consists of what their body actually needs. And the reason why is because we are all kind of messed up. We have to th we are always thinking, well, you know, um, you know, I, I, I could never do that. Get that out of your mindset. What should matter is where do I live? Where do I live? Th that's going to make a huge difference. If I'm up in Canada and it's really cold, I'm going to have a really, really hard time just going and saying, I'm going to eat some blueberries for the day. That's not going to work for you because you're in an unnatural environment where those things don't even grow. So you're going to have to do some things that are a little bit unnatural. You might even have to incorporate some roots because roots are really high in dense uh, carbo complex carbohydrates. And they are in, uh, you know, they have a lot of sugars that are going to break down really slowly. And you don't find that a lot in fruits. You find quick digesting things in fruit because you're able to find them everywhere. So you're going to want something to really heat the body up and, and retain some of that energy. And you just won't be able to find that growing where you live. So, yeah, you might have to do some things that are a little bit unnatural just because you're in an unnatural environment. But for the, a lot of us, I'm out here in the middle right now. Um, it's real hot where I am. Um, look, it's 109, I think, right now. So yeah so it's real warm i don't have a problem like you know walking around and going oh I'm, I'm thirsty or i can walk up to a fruit tree i can find olives and cherries and grapes and uh carob and mesquite there's a lot that can grow out here and a lot of citrus too and these are all hydrating things for the desert right so you eat a little bit of them you feel good you can go about your day and you can just walk around and eat all the food that you need off of your natural environment a lot of people can't do that though so you're you're stuck with what the grocery store has and uh, you got to know, OK, well, maybe I, I, it's really cold here. I should probably have some honey. Honey's really good at warming the body up, really high density calories and probably some coconut. Coconut's condensed high calories, lots of natural fats. So you eat some of that. It's sustaining you. It's going to it's going to work a lot better than if you're out in a nice warm area where you eat a papaya and you feel good. You're nice and hydrated. You don't need hydration when you're up in the forest in the frost where it's snowing on you. A papaya is not going to do anything for you, but make you more cold. So you have to know where you live and what's going to work best for you there. Yeah, cool. Cool, man. Um, so this person asks, how do you fight cravings or, or how to fight cravings for people who have been on and off with the raw, but want to stay raw. What are some common detox symptoms and uncommon ones when one was, and when was the last time you got sick? Oh, uh, okay, uh, there were a lot of questions. So try to remind me as we go through them, I'll start back, I'll start at the end and go backwards. Um, uh, I got sick, I think, with the coronavirus right at the beginning i caught it i was down for one day i was laying down and i just coughed a lot and i had a massive headache and then the next day i was good so that was that was it um 
I, I don't, I don't, I never got checked. I never, I never went out and be like, oh my gosh, I got it. I'm going to check myself in the hospital because I know that the virus attacks the lungs. So I have an oxygen machine here. So I figured, you know, if it gets bad and it starts really messing with my respiratory system, I'll just hook myself up to the oxygen machine. I'm fine. You know, cause everybody was out of them in the beginning. All the respirators were used up because everybody that was, you know, going to the hospital needed a respirator. So they were out, but I own my own. <laughs> so I didn't actually go. So I, I yeah, not very long ago, but before that, I couldn't even tell you when. I mean, it's been so long. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah, you usually don't catch what a the average person catches. I used to get sick once a year with strep throat, and you would see these white bumps kind of running down my esophagus when I'd look in my throat. And I'd catch that every year after I went raw. Maybe uh, uh, two years in, I noticed, hey, I didn't get strep throat this year. And then it never came back, ever, ever. Not even once has it hit me in, in Christmas like it used to. So that's pretty cool. And uh, detox symptoms really don't happen. Even when I do like a heavy metal cleanse now, or when I do a calcification cleanse, I really don't feel any detox symptoms, but I also work out. So I'm probably not the best person to ask for that because I continuously am doing something physical. Now I don't really recommend it. Uh, I actually think from my, from my studies, the people that work out the most intense and the longest actually don't do very good for their longevity. I think because the, the heart rate naturally wants to stay low, it's probably best to keep it kind of low. Exercise should be mitigated to like a normal human activity. And when I exercise, I don't do that. I do really high intensity interval training and that's not good. So I'm not recommending people do what I do when it comes to exercise. It's just my kind of addiction and I've been doing it for so long. I know it's counterintuitive. And uh, my other big flaw is that I don't sleep good. Like last night, this tree here fell down. A lot of the palm fronds fell down all over my training stuff. And you can see it actually on the ground all over. And it made a huge mess all over my mats. And uh, that I was cleaning that up because I got a guy coming over to train when this is over. So I, I stayed up real, real late and I'm usually working on things. So I do have some bad habits, but my eating is good. My supplementation is good. And I at least know what a lot to do. And then when it comes to cravings, I usually I, I know myself and my cravings are going to come in either two forms. I'm either going to crave some kind of a sugar or I'm going to crave some type of a salt. And when salt hits me, the first thing I reach to are these like Botiva olives from like um, uh, essential living foods. And they make some herbed olives and they also make some salted ones. And um, I usually just eat maybe 10 or 12 olives. And I tell you, man, that robs that salt craving completely, completely gone. And I noticed that when I overdo sugar, I crave more salt. So, and when I overdo salt, I'll usually crave more sugar. And what I used to do obviously is when I crave sugar, I just eat honey. But then I kind of got away from the honey because I didn't have any more to harvest. I usually share honey with the bees over here and uh, that's gone now. So. Honey is not really a thing, but you get it so much from fruit that it's not, I don't really crave sugar at all anymore because uh, I'm eating more than one meal a day and I don't really have a craving for, for sugar at all anymore. I crave salt. So that's what I reach to. And if you don't want to, if it's too expensive, because they are really expensive, I mean, they're like 10 to $15 a pack and it only lasts you about three to four or five days. So what I've normally reached to now is sometimes seaweed. I like dulse a lot. Dulse is a really good seaweed. I know our oceans are polluted, but here's the thing. The, um, what makes seaweed really good is they contain a particular thing called sodium alginate. And sodium alginate is what actually binds to radioactive elements and pulls them into themselves. So yes, they might have some radioactive elements into them in these isotopes like uh, uh, potassium 40, but what'll happen is the sodium alginate binds to these elements and it'll extract it from, its, from the body. So whatever it has, it won't go really into your body. And what's in your body usually gets sucked into the very plant material itself, like a fiber magnet. So it pulls it in by the sodium alginate, so it extracts it from your body. The so seaweeds end up being quite good for you at the same time. They're just a little high in iodine, and I know people actually take it for the iodine, and I usually tell people don't consume it very often for the iodine. So it's kind of funny. I usually tell people, you only want seaweed every so often. Did you know they actually get your dose of iodine for the month? You only need to eat it once a month. Oh, that's how that's cool. how much iodine is actually in seaweed. So you don't need it very much and you don't need a lot of doses of it. But I'm just saying if you're craving a lot of salt, it's one of the good sources that you can reach to and not really have too many issues with unless you really 
or have a parathyroid gland problem or a T3, T4 count off on your thyroid and you've got to wash your iodine, of course you need to regulate it and take care of it then. Then buy the olives. You know, don't be crazy. Don't don't re, don't be like, uh, I, oh, I'm raw Matt said eat all the seaweed I want and I've got a thyroid problem. No, no, no. <laughs> Go for olives if that's the case. Plus I'm pushing fruit. You know, olive is a fruit and uh, seaweed is a vegetable. So obviously I want you to reach to the fruit first and olive means to olive. It's one of the oldest trees on earth and it's an, uh, it's an olive. So it contains one of the most natural fats that actually matches your body. It's an aromatase inhibitor. So it protects your hormones from flipping bad to good or good to bad. It's just really, really good. It's overall, it's a great, it's a great fruit. Awesome. Cool. So for iodine, do you think the amount of iodine in say something like uh, Irish sea moss, um, is that like too much? Like I know it's different for each seaweed, probably the amounts. Um, but I don't know if you know anything about like, like how much of like Irish sea moss you should be taking. Yeah, I'll tell you that one right now. The reason why Irish sea moss is not a problem is because you're never going to open it right out of the package and eat it. You're going to soak it in water. And because water's a solvent, you're, and most of the iodine is going to leach out into your water that you're straining down your sink anyway. So by the time you actually get to your Irish moss, it's going to have very low amounts of iodine left in it. So you're safe with it. Cool. It'll be so actually it's, higher in kelp and dulse. But, oh, okay. So you can have it more frequently than the Irish sea moss. Yes, a lot more yeah. frequently. It's going to be very, very low. Very, very low. Matter of fact, most of the minerals that are going to be in your Irish moss are going to be lost. So it's not anything to worry about. It's actually more of a concern with the kelp and the dulse than it is in Irish sea moss. Because if you've ever pulled oh. Irish sea moss, I mean, it's pure salt. Nobody could eat that. You soak it so it bloats up. And then that way you can make gel or, or desserts with it you know what i mean it's like your binding element so it's not anything that you have to concern yourself with when it comes to like oh man how much uh how much of this am i going to eat before i have to worry don't worry about it you've lost almost everything that's in it <laughs> all the water soluble vitamins are gone a lot of minerals are gone most of the iodine's gone you know there's nothing to worry about cool but there is a little bit in there if you eat it frequently enough right that you're going to be getting enough iodine or yeah, don't worry about iodine because in the in the human cell, when you're looking at the cell, what what's going to go? Picture this is the cell, and right here is where um, iodine goes. Well, guess what? Also fits right there. Pectin. What's in fruit? Pectin. So don't worry about it. For instance, if you're going to be going to, uh, on a flight and you're going to be in the upper atmosphere, what happens is radiation gets into the cell, but it can only get into the cell if there's two things missing. One. Think about it. Uh, what can what tries to get in? Iodine and pectin. Those are your two protectors from radiation. So that's why a lot of people that survived Hiroshima survived when they ate lots of soy and seaweed. The reason why is because of their high amounts of natural pectin and sodium alginate, which actually, and iodine. So they have every element that protected their cells from high doses of radiation. So when you're flying, you want to you want to snack on apples, lots of pectin. You want to uh, sunflower seeds, lots of pectin, seaweed, or some fermented soy. All of those are really good sources to protect your cells from high amounts of radiation. And those are the people that survive to this day from Hiroshima. So, cool. Nothing so, so something, something like Irish sea moss would be better for like collagen then, right? So. I mean, yes, exactly. Yeah. A collagen thing. Exactly. It's the, the amino acid content is what does that. Good point. Cool. Okay. So, um, uh, so this person asks, uh, I'm, the wording is kind of weird because I, I was, I was writing it down kind of, okay. So it's, do you see a pattern or transition for like you for like your, like your your um your experience from eating smoothies or complex salads and then kind of like when you like when you started like the the difference between when you started eating like raw and then yeah. like, you know having the different combinations and then finding the more like easier to digest um types of foods later on okay and then, and, yeah Okay. Uh, yes. Um, when I started, I had a horrendous appetite. I would lay, I would wake up and I would go to McDonald's and then I would go to the drive through and I'd get like a cheese croissant for a snack, like a brunch between lunch. And then lunch was usually 
something that I'd bring, say, you know, some horrible thing. I can't even remember what my lunch was. And then I'd come home and I'd usually eat like a barbecue or I'd eat Carl's Jr. And then uh, dinner was like a gigantic bowl of pasta. You know what I mean? So I, I went from that to all fruit. So yes, my fruit cravings were huge and I would make like massive portions of like mashed up like figs. So I'd like a huge bowl of figs and I'd eat it and I wouldn't have any digestive issues. Now I think I would. And the reason I say that is because when I try to eat that amount today, I can't do it. I don't know if it's because my stomach was so stretched out in the beginning. And I also don't know if it's because my digestion did get weaker from doing it. Remember, fruit is very easy to digest. So my body's very acclimated to doing that now. And these other foods like McDonald's, that, that's a lot of processing going on. So I don't know if it was because I was younger and in my you know early 20s or if it's because, you know, I'm 40s now and I'm not, I don't digest as good or I don't eat those type of foods. Like if, if my family wants to go out and we go to like, let's say the Cheesecake Factory and I go, give me the... Um, what are they, the Thai lettuce wraps, substitute the chicken for avocado. And then what I do is I fill it up with the cucumber and the avocado. And then I got the, uh, the parsley and I wrap it up and I eat it. I usually don't feel so good. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, even though that's a real simple meal, I'm still like, Ooh, that was, that was a weird combination of foods. So yes, I did lose my capacity to like diversify and eat massive amounts of random high, like high diversity of foods. But that's because I don't really eat foods outside of in my natural realm anyway, you know, nuts, seeds, some fruits, uh, uh, very few vegetables, flowers, pollens, you know, bee pollen, you know, real simple stuff now. So I can mix those. Sure. But, you know, I really just don't. And I, but I can eat I can eat pretty good quality now. Like um, I'll dice up some tomatoes. I'll put them in a bowl. I'll, I'll dump in a bunch of olives and then I'll put in my fake cheese for dinner. That's it. That's my bowl. And I can eat about a thousand calories just in that one meal, probably more of just that. So that's a lot of food and it weighs a lot. I'm like, ooh, that's more than a pound of food. But I, I feel pretty good. And I'm going up in weight by doing it, even though I'm doing massive amount of training. So, yeah, there's been a there's been a, some things I've learned a lot going through my different trials. Because when I started, and like most people, you don't really know what you can do or what you should do. So I kind of I, I kind of wrote some stuff down for people based on um, I always tell people get a methylmalonic acid test because it's going to show you on your age on how much B12 your body naturally produces, if it if it produces any at all. So for a person that maybe is 50 years old, they're not going to do a good transition to completely raw vegan. And the reason why is because their body for its entire life has always been obtaining B12 from food. So now all of a sudden you knock out all B12, your body is not going to be very good at going, I'm going to produce the amount of B12 that I need because it's never needed to. So they're not going to do very good with no B12 in their diet because it's always naturally obtained it from food. So depending on your age, when you transition, I did it very young, so I have no problem at all not supplementing iron, not supplementing B12, not supplementing the typical things that most people need to in their diet because I started so young. So that's another factor. Awesome. awesome. Uh, so I guess, yeah, talking about iron and those things um, in the B12, this question is, how, is your, how has your blood work been um, up to you know, the 20 years that you've been raw, uh, what about B vitamins? And then the next part of the question is, have you moved to a different climate uh, for it to be more uh, sustainable? I think it means, like, oh, I think the tar sun, like the sun and the... Uh, the what, sorry, the end? what did you say at the end? Uh, I think that, I think the question about, um, it says, have you moved to a more sustainable, or are a different climate for it to be sustainable. So I think they're talking about like, uh, like, like where like food, more food would grow, like the like oh, tropical stuff. Nah. Yeah, no, I've always lived in the desert here. I've been in the desert for like most of my time. I mean, I've moved a couple times, and um, but it was into it was in other areas where food was readily available. You know, Northern California isn't as hot, so there was actually more food there. But I, I'm back in the desert. I've been here since like '97. And I've had no problem at all with finding food here. And this is 
a harsh environment. I mean, behind me is pretty, but that's because it's watered with irrigation and it's a homeowner's association paid to make it look pretty. But overall, this is a natural desert. So to find anything that's lack actually alive, you go into the canyons where the waterfall is from natural springs and that's where you can find everything growing. But I never had to move because of it. I mean, if I was gonna move, I would move to the tropics and that's where the biggest diversity of flora is going to be and you're going to find all kinds of different plants and fruit that just grow everywhere like when i went to hawaii i thought oh my gosh you never need to buy food ever again in your life there's guava growing everywhere like a weed there's mango trees 50 feet high with mangoes everywhere there's avocados that you don't even notice because there's so many of them there's uh you know uh, these weird looking egg things. Anyway, there's so much fruit there and here you got to go hunt for it. You better, you bet you you have to know where to look, but yeah, it's easier with tropics because we're naturally a tropical people, right? We're naturally placed into a garden. I usually tell people, if you believe that you were created by God, then you were placed in the garden of Eden to eat the fruit from the tree. That's what the Bible says, if you believed in evolution, well, what did man do before they invented fire? Well, they walked around and they eat raw plants. That's it. So either way you look at it, there's no excuse to say that when we go back in time, we weren't fruitarian. We just were. There's no there's no doubt about it. So I just go back to that natural diet because it was naturally what we were designed to eat and you'll feel the best on it. Now, again, if you get away from those natural climates and you get into those weird places where it's really cold, that's not natural. So, yes, you might have to do some unnatural things. And I always recommend people to move. Yeah, move to where it's really good for your body. There's a reason why when people get old and they want to retire, they move to the, the Florida and here. They move where it's warm and it feels good. And you can, you can, your body doesn't hurt naturally because cold doesn't feel good. It makes your body ache. It's, there's nothing natural about it. So there, I always tell people, yeah, move. <laughs> get out of there. Get out of the Denmark, Norway, Sweden, man. It's horrible. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. I, for sure. I agree. I really agree. <laughs> um, okay, so what about like, uh, like physical performance? I already know this answer from you. Because like, I, I, you're, you know, I know you're, uh, you're, in, you were into like, well, you still are into like weightlifting and MMA and all this stuff. But like, how did it affect you? Like when you went raw, and then to now? like physical performance for like weight gain or like uh, muscle gain or just in general, just, yeah. Um, um, weight, weight gain and loss comes down to calories. Can you eat enough to gain or, or do not hold it? Also, what's your metabolism? I'm naturally thin. Before I went raw, I ate six times a day and I naturally weighed 135 pounds. I've been raw, I only eat twice in a day and I weigh 135 pounds. So you know what I mean? There's not much difference. It's just what you assimilate and how many calories do you eat? If I want to slam two more meals in a day, I could gain more weight. It's so it's easy. If I, if I want to gain weight quicker, I stop exercising more too. It's easy because I naturally don't contain much body fat. My, my metabolism is so quick, I can actually gain more weight by working out less frequently. So is, if that's your goal, then yeah, you just you want to be able to consume more calories and work out with heavy weights and don't do endurance don't do cardio insane you know slam a lot of carbs you'll gain weight your, your weight will come on there's no doubt about it i'm at a good weight for what i like to do for my type of training and i don't really want to get a lot bigger because i start getting to 140 pounds my body doesn't move the same i like my body to be consistent so with consistency and being my natural weight i feel comfortable going if i'm going to react i can move at that speed and i know my punch will land I might be a little stronger at the next weight, but it'll be a little, it'll be a little slower, right? So you, it just depends on really what you're going for. Remember being in the gym and pushing weight is entirely different than wrestling with a human being. They're entirely different sports. So it, it depends on what you want to do. Is your sport athletic? Do you want to run or ride a bike? It's an entirely different thing than being in the gym and trying to deadlift 400 pounds. They're a different sport. So it depends on what you mean by athletic performance because mine was always on martial arts. So when I started, I lost weight and I was like, oh no, I don't want to lose weight. I'm already having trouble keeping it on. But remember, uh, I was, I'd get up and I'd run to the gym. Then I'd weight train. Then I'd go to boxing. Then I'd go to jujitsu. And then I'd go to judo. That's five times of training in one day. 
of course I'm going to have trouble gaining weight going raw because I was eating McDonald's, which probably had 1,000 to 2,000 calories just for breakfast, and now I'm eating figs mashed up. So I started losing weight, but my endurance went up. I noticed my heart could handle it, and I didn't build up the lactic acid. My recovery was a little bit faster, and I didn't get a sore, but it was harder to keep the weight on. So I sacrificed a little bit in the beginning. Then I realized, you know what? It comes down to just not training as much because I already had good cardio. I didn't need to train five times a day, but I had that mentality where I needed to learn more. I wanted to learn. I needed to, I needed to get better at judo. I needed to get better at jujitsu. I needed to get better at wrestling or boxing. So now that those are already good, I don't need to learn anything from them. All I have to do now is go, I, as long as my cardio is good and I can wrestle for an hour straight, I'm good. I'm golden. I don't need to learn. So I don't go to 10 classes a day. You know, I, I, I weight train and I grapple. That's it. I don't do any other thing anymore. I'm already good. But, you know, I have 20 years under my belt now. <laughs> easy, easy, or even more. I, so no real reason. And um, I usually tell people, um, if, if what I'm doing is wrong, compete with me. Compete with not, not physically. I mean, sure, we can fight, but that's that's irrelevant. That's pointless. That comes down to experience. I want you to pick a food. Say you believe that we're carnivores. Go ahead. Pick a pick a form of cattle and you just eat that. You can even pick my fruit. I don't care which one it is. You can pick cherries. I'll just eat cherries. You just eat your lamb or pork, whatever it is, and we'll see who outlasts. Go as long as you can. I'll just eat cherries for the next six months. We'll see where you are in six months. You can really tell what your natural diet is just from that challenge alone. I've challenged multiple people. Nobody's ever taken it. Maybe you'll find somebody, but nobody ever yeah. does. Yeah. For sure. Um, okay. Um, is there yeah uh so supplements i know we kind of already went through this but like what about like deficiencies people are always worried about like all sorts of like different protein deficiencies or or like b12 we talked about iodine and b12 already though um or something like i don't know there's all these random things that people come up with and sure. you know, that if we're eating the right things right, right and I guess if you're worried, like, you can always go get a blood test. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, right. that's right. You did ask me that question earlier about B vitamins as well. So, yeah, yeah you can definitely get a blood test. My, my blood tests are always fine. They're always kind of, like, right on the normal level. They're never really too high or too low, which is surprising because most of the time when I do a blood test, I start knocking everything down. And I'll, I'll pay for a really expensive one, too. So I'll, I'll, like, come in with, like, you know, like, one meal a day type of thing just to see where I'm at. And... And things are like right there, right on the border. And um, and that's without ever supplementing B12 in any way, shape or form, unless it's in some random drink that somebody sneaks it in at like Whole Foods, I'm not getting it. And my numbers are always good. So you got to think about it. M vitamins are mostly water soluble. The ones that aren't are vitamin A, D, E, and K. And these are fat soluble, meaning that you store them so long in your liver, there's no fear of running out of vi those vitamins. Like vitamin A stores in your liver for four years. Are you telling me you're not going to get any vitamin A from fruit in four years? Don't worry about fat soluble. Don't worry about them. They're going to be there. The rarest one that is probably the vitamin D. And so the, that's that's the harder one to get in foods, right? It's only in mushrooms, uh, some things that are really exposed a lot to like a lot high levels of sun. They'll have some vitamin D, but for the most part, because your body makes it, is nothing really to worry about, right? I've never had low vitamin D, and I completely avoid the sun. I'm one of the rare raw food people that's like I don't go anywhere near the sun anymore. I used to live in it, and I started to get like, oh, I'm getting sun damage from doing this too much. So I just avoid it altogether right now. I mean, entirely. That's really extreme. I don't I don't tell anybody just completely avoid it. I just don't do it at all myself. I want to see what's going to happen. So I don't have anything that's really low. So when we're talking about like a vitamin deficiency, you got to realize that vitamins are water soluble. You're going to get B vitamins, almost everything that you eat. It's cooking food that's going to make you deficient. It's cooking away all these water soluble vitamins. It's boiling foods in water that you're going to lose all these B vitamins. And minerals, minerals are going to be in your foods, whether or not you cook them or not. So minerals are actually dependent on what grows. Because one of my favorite foods is coconut, coconut grows right from ocean water. What has more minerals than the ocean? Nothing, right? So yeah, I'm getting some of the highest mineral concentration fruits in the world by eating olives and coconut every single day. I have no fear of mineral loss, especially the amount of sweating that I do. Like literally m mineral loss comes from sweat too, right? You can, you can taste your sweat and tell there's a lot of salt in there. What's salt? Salt's a mineral. 
That's why animals love salt too. You put a salt lick outside, animals come from everywhere to go lick the salt because they love the minerals, right? They're, they're even mineral deficient trying to eat off nature. Things are so mineral deficient nowadays because we've ruined our topsoil in America from the Great Dust Bowl in the early 1900s or 1800s. So what happened is we miss a lot of minerals in our soil. So just eat diversity. Make sure that the fruits that you're eating come from soil that's really rich. You're golden. You're good to go. You don't even need to supplement it. Now, if you're concerned about it, sure, one multivitamin a day will take care of it. I even recommend that if people do take a multivitamin, make sure that it's not a one a day. Make sure it's the ones that say they're three a day and even break those in half and take them maybe twice a day. You don't need all of them. You don't need these 100 percent of your daily value things. They're still eating food. These are too much. Remember, everything that you consume has to go through your liver and your kidneys. And your kidneys are always processing things. That's why kidneys don't do so good on high amounts of protein because they have to filter out all the extra pro excess protein and they can, it can build up. It can be a little bit hard. Now, is it detrimental? No, not if you're working out. But if you are processing high amounts of protein without working out, now you're putting extra stress on your organs for no reason at all. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So the vitamin D, how is that? How is that created in the body naturally, or is it? Or yeah, the D three you're talking about. Yeah, or... vitamin D is produced when your body comes into contact with the sun, and the sun yeah, yeah, touches yeah. your flesh, and then it converts naturally into vitamin D in the body. Vitamin D three is the form that you would consume naturally. That would be a very natural source, akin to what you would get from the sun as where vitamin D2 would be a form that your body would only assimilate as much as it, as it would desire before it would get rid of excess. So it's a little bit of a safer vi vitamin because vitamin Ds, you can overdose. You can overdose on any vi any fat soluble one, vitamin A, D, E, and K, as where the B vitamins, you urinate the A out the excess whereas the fat soluble ones you can overdose on that's why people that drink a lot of carrot juice turn orange it's because there's a lot of toxicity they're consuming too much vitamin a and the liver can't store it all and get rid of it all as fast enough so it's trying to throw it out of your body as quick as it can and the fastest way to do that is out of your skin so it's turning your body orange that's toxicity that's that's overdosing on vitamin a okay that makes sense so it's, it's a it's a hormone right vitamin d it is. It is. They call it a vitamin, but it's not a vitamin. You're right. It is a hormone. Same with B10, biotin. Bi biotin is not a vitamin B. It's actually a hormone. It's called a vitamin B11, but it's actually a hormone. It's the same. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so herbs, I know you're talking about, you like a lot of herbs, like the, um, what are the medicinal herbs. What, is some, what are some main medicinal herbs that you like recommend for people and why? And obviously, like not everybody probably needs them or yes they do um, okay okay all right yes they That's do and i'll tell you why i'll tell you why okay. eating a papaya eating a mango eating grapes they're not going to give you what these medicinal herbs do and i'll tell you why okay so okay. yes there are going to be some things that i recommend and i recommend them for everybody and here's why let's say that you want to take something for your brain the best thing you could probably take for your brain would be ashwagandha and now ashwagandha is an herb that comes from the Ayurvedic system, meaning in India. And they found that this plant was very good for your brain and they've been documenting this for thousands of years. But here's the thing, now recently we have the science to actually study it. So what they found is that ashwagandha is good for every single human on earth, meaning it's, there's no toxicity level, there's no allergens, and you can eat it like you would actually eat it like a food, meaning there's no, there's no like minimal amount and there's no maximum amount. So you can be very careless with this herb and you can just put it into your tea, you can eat it like whole. If you don't like the taste, you can take it in a capsule form. It doesn't matter as long as you get it into your body. Now here's the fascinating thing about ashwagandha. It passes the blood brain barrier. So it rebuilds the dendrite that grow to the neurons in your brain. So you regain that ability of lost memory. So people that have dementia and Alzheimer's, it reactivates the gene that's associated with Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's is associated with what you do, meaning it's epigenetic. It's epigenetic re regulated by what we do in our life. So if you, as some people say, oh, it's, I mean, it's genetic. My parents had it, so I'm gonna get it. That's, they figured that's completely untrue meaning we might carry the gene, but it doesn't matter because that gene still has to be activated. So if you activate the gene by your lifestyle, you'll get Alzheimer's, but you can reverse it at the same time, or you'll never have to get it to begin with. Ashwagandha is one of those herbs. It increases superoxide dismutase 2, which is a metabolic enzyme that's actually increased in the brain, 
and it reverses the dendrite, right? So it remakes it grow again. So ashwagandha is a body adaptogen, a brain adaptogen, so it helps your brain deal with stress, and it's good for everybody. So I see nothing wrong with that herb. So when people say, name an herb, I usually say ashwagandha. Great herb. Why? Because most people are induced with stress. Stress is one of the worst things that there is for you. So you, I've just given somebody an herb that they can take that's good for their brain, good for their memory, reverses Alzheimer's or prevents Alzheimer's, and they can consume it any day they want, as much as they want, whenever they want. They don't have to know how much to take. And it's not only good for their memory, it's not only good for their brain, uh, it's really good for longevity, and it increases superoxide dismutase too, so your brain doesn't shrink. I mean... You tell me of something that's better. I mean, it's incredible how, how important these things are and how good they are for your body and brain. Like, I have an incredible memory now. Incredible. I get punched in the head for a living. I shouldn't have a very good memory at all. Think about it. Most people that are boxers and, and, and people that get punched, they're sitting there. They, uh, they're, they're twitching. They have a problem. They can't, they can't have a conversation. They sound messed up. They can't recall anything. They have a, they have a very limited window. But the, the reason why is because being hit is very damaging to the brain. And we have the ability to rebuild brain neurons in the brain. It's called neurogenesis. But there's not enough time for the brain to do that when you're going to go back to the very next day and get hit in the head. So you can speed that process up by herbalism. Foods don't do that. Herbs do. So, yes, I'm a huge fan of herbs. Let me go through a list real quick. That way, Pepper will have the list. And then I can go through what they are. I recommend grapeseed extract. Grape street extract ends up being really good and it lasts in the body for up to three days. So yes, it's a little expensive, but you only have to take it every three days. The reason I recommend grapeseed extract is because it's one of the most powerful aromatase inhibitors in the world. And what happens is because humans, especially males, we're not very, we don't have a very good hormone, meaning we have testosterone that's dominant in our bodies. And when that testosterone can flips, it becomes dangerous inside of our body, meaning it converts to DHT. And DHT is a very volatile hormone and it goes through the blood and it causes damage. Matter of fact, it's the main reason we get hair loss is because DHT converts and shrinks the hair follicle up and we lose our hair. So grapeseed extract is an aromatase inhibitor. It prevents testosterone from flipping to DHT. So it gets rid of it in another way, meaning we can, it binds to the aromatization and it makes it so we get it out through the blood and the urination system. We get it out of our body. It protects your system now from that bad hormone. Women are naturally more protected because they have estrogen and that's three hormone flips away from being dangerous. So they don't really need this one as much. So they can take a uh, pycnogenol uh, is from, uh, you know, pine bark. They can take that one instead. It ends up being very similar to grapeseed extract in the, in the fact that it's a natural antioxidant that works in a very water and fat soluble element at the same time through the entire body. But it works in conjunction mm, with the body while not being grapeseed extract while working in a very similar way. And again, it works up to three days. So it's very, very good. The next one I recommend is jogulin or uh, gynostima is another name for it. Now that just depends on if you like plants. Uh, again, it's an herb, it's a leaf and you would consume it and it would increase the metabolic enzyme of superoxide dismutase. And it wouldn't do it in the brain, it will do it in the mitochondria. And the reason this is important is because they've discovered that how much superoxide dismutase your body produces on a daily basis is determining on how much you're going to live. So when we're young, we produce about 80 micrograms per deciliter in the bloodstream. And when we get about 80, we only produce about eight, meaning it's so far down, you're going to probably only live about eight more years. So they find when they look at a sea tortoise, for example, they live about 250 years and they produce about 250 micrograms every single day. So we know that how long you live is based on how much you produce in a day. Now, by consuming these superoxide dismutase enhancers of the body, you're not going to give more to your body. You're going to enhance what your body naturally wants to produce. So if you produce about 80, you're going to produce 80 every single day that you take these. So you're never actually going to have an end to your life by actually boosting these up because it will always remain a base level. So I'm never going to say, oh, you increase, you take a, uh, let's say that you buy a superoxide dismutase capsule and it says 250 milligram. Well, your body's not going to produce 250 milligrams of it. It's not going to be at that base level. It can't pass 80. So it's kind of wasteful. You're actually going to be urinating out all the extra. It's, it's completely pointless. But what you will do is you'll get to base level. 
So uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, a gerontologist who studies aging for a living, he actually thinks that these are pointless and to not do them. It's called one of the seven theories of aging. And I actually show in the study why that's irrelevant. And his theory actually doesn't match up to the evidence because when we look at animals, you can see their lifespan is directly correlated with how much superoxide dismutase their body produces. You get an animal like a mouse that lives for about two years, you, uh, you actually find out that it actually only produces about two micrograms. So we have a direct correlation with how much the body produces to how long you're going to live. So that's why I usually recommend it first. Now, yes, goji is one of the things that produces. And the only study I've ever found that it, how much it enhances is about 8%. So about eight grams. So not very much, but it still does help. But goji is actually consumed as one of my top herbs because it's a sesquiterpenine, meaning it's a natural producer of human growth hormone in the body. Not many foods do that. So it's a really good one to increase HGH naturally because the only other way to increase HGH is by not eating. So if you want to eat and still produce HGH, goji berry is your go-to food for that. It's the only one on earth they've ever found. So you have to incorporate goji into your program. So now we have two things, right? We have superoxide dismutase being boosted up and we have goji for HGH. We have uh, ashwagandha for the superoxide dismutase 2 in the brain. So now we have three herbs. So now by increasing superoxide dismutase, now we have another problem. By increasing superoxide dismutase, you've now knocked out most of the superoxide that's in the body, which is a damaging free radical. So it's gonna convert into your body and it's gonna turn into hydrogen peroxide. Now you have another problem. The more hydrogen peroxide builds up in the body without glutathione, you don't have enough glutathione reductase or peroxidase, now the hydrogen peroxide is gonna build up. It shouldn't be above 33.8% of any single cell in the body. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to need to produce more glutathione now. And you, you'll know quickly if you're not because you'll start to get graying of hair. How do you prevent graying of hair? Well, one of the best ways to do that is by, again, an herb. I grow photi are over there. That's called Polygeum Multiflorum. I grow it, you don't need to. You can buy it online. And that's another good one. Uh, what that does is they found that that en enhances uh, uh, glut uh, glutathione levels, particularly um, glutathione peroxidase. And what that does is that lowers the amount of hydrogen peroxide building up in the body so you can convert it, kind of like catalase does. Catalase is much harder to find though. One of the best sources for that would be um, uh, turmeric root or curcumin. That would be probably one of the best for that. But if you don't want to buy an extra one, go for the faux thai. A lot of people don't like faux thai because it's uh, kind of a weird taste, kind of tastes like coffee. So people don't like the taste. So, okay, take curcumin. Uh, take one that's got, you know, um, uh, standardized extract. Make sure it's really potent and you only take it once a day. So that'll, that'll raise your catalase level rather than you having to raise the glutathione level. Since they work in conjunction with each other at both almost doing the same type of thing, I recommend glutathione. It's more, it's stronger than catalase. But if you're short on money, curcumin, turmeric, these are much cheaper than Fotai would be. The good thing about Fotai is it's not very popular, so it's cheap stuff and you can get it. I like growing my own because I like the root raw and I grind it up and I just eat the raw powder. And you can't find the raw powder online. You always find the, the, the processed powder and it's black and they boil it with uh, black beans. So you're getting one that's a little easier on the liver. The raw one can have some tannins. So you gotta be very careful with that one. And most, and they don't wanna tell the public, you know, oh, be careful. They know the public won't, they'll just consume it and hurt themselves. So they always sell the processed version. So there you go, you've got five herbs now. Um, I would say that those are my go-to. I have those every single day. If you want another one, I would recommend e either being C60 or uh, uh, astragalus root. The reason why is because astragalus root is one that's been found to actually enhance telomeres. Now, other things have as well lately, but this one works really good. They actually sell a product that directly comes from standardized astragalus extract. And what it does is called T60. And what it does is they found that the telomeres, which pad the end of each chromosome, start to wear down as we get sicker, as we get older. So you need to enhance these telomeres. You don't want to get them short because the shorter they get. Yeah, go ahead. One moment. I got it. Is it okay if I go to the restroom real quick? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, man. <laughs> One moment. I'll get a drink too. How's that sound?
Anyway, I'm back now too. Here we go. I ran away to grab a drink as well. Cool. Yeah, I was holding that for a long time. I, at the beginning, <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't have to go at the beginning. <laughs> cool. We're almost done, anyways. Okay. You were talking about uh, what were you talking about? The the one of the herbs. Yeah, I was just going down the list of my favorite herbs that I recommend for everybody. So as long as I was really able to cover the superoxide dismutase, well, you know, in the brain and in the body, and then how to boost glutathione levels and catalase levels, and how to um, have a good aromatase inhibitor, that's really good. And then I covered one for telomeres. I wanted to make sure that people have good pads on the other telomeres. C60 is very expensive, and basically what it is, is it's a carbon atom that's... Um, uh, particularly fullerene number 60 that they've isolated from activated charcoal and what they did is they found this in this one in particular was able to boost telomeres and how long your telomeres actually are de is also dependent on how long and how healthy you're going to be when telomeres shrink you end up getting sick disease getting cancer and you die so the longer your telomeres the more protected and your, and protective your chromosomes actually are so for picture for example the aging diseases Look at progeria and Warner syndrome. These are aging diseases where a little child at the age of 11, 10 or 11 are starting to die from old age. Their vision goes, their hair falls away. They end up getting sick. They lose their teeth and they die. Why is that? Why do they have the symptoms of an older person at a very young age? It's because their telomeres are gone. They only have very, very small padding on the end of their telomeres. So these telomeres being short are not good. We want to have them longer. We want to have them at full length. But every cell replication, they shrink a little bit more every single time and we get older and eventually our telomeres are almost gone. We want to keep them long. We don't want them like super long. I'm just saying that we want to grow them back to their original length and we don't want to have them be shrinking. So a stragglus root is one of those things that can keep them long. And that's uh, that's one that's notorious. That's one that uh, Lee Chong Yin consumed every single day. He lived to be really, really old. So now if that's one that you like, good. Um, I always tell people, get it in an extract form. That way you don't have to boil it and make a tea out of it. You can just take the, the powder and put it on whatever you want because it's already an extract, meaning it's already been heated to the point where the saponins are, are used, utilized and now it's going to be active. And saponins are the active ingredient in a stragglus root. So you're going to need that. And heat is the only way to activate these saponins. But if you don't want to go to that, to go to the C60, now you get that fullerene number 60 that's been infused into olive oil and it lasts in your body for about a week. So what they did in the experiments is they actually took a C60 and they injected it into the stomach of brown rats. Now, these rats only live for about two years. So after they injected these things, starting at midlife, mind you, they didn't even start these mice out at young age. They only did, started this at midlife. This is what makes it so important. Now, uh, they lived for about four to five years. That's double their lifespan. To a human being, that's not just getting to 200. That's like living to 400. That's just on one element. That's just from C60 alone. So I actually make it myself. So if anybody out there even wants it, I still even have some. I infused it into olive oil really quickly. And then what I did is I, uh, I put it in an amber glass, Miron glass. Miron glass makes it unoxidizable. So it'll never go rancid. It'll never go bad. And it'll never be exposed to the elements. So that you can open the bottle and you can take it whenever you want. You can take it once a week. That's what the rat experiment did. Sometimes you can take it more often. Sometimes it's a waste of money to do it, right? Why waste it? Just do it every three days. So I just do mine every three days in a little smaller dose. Then I'm guaranteed to have more in my system because remember, I'm, I'm sweating more. So I'm going to lose a little bit more than a rat running around a little empty cage. So keep that in consideration. Those are your two best for telomeres. But keeping your telomeres long is very, very important. They have other ways of doing it now, but those are your two best. So, okay. <laughs> No, I think you can find, uh, you, you have this book, the uh, Free Food Medicine book by Marcus. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure you can find a lot of those in here. This book is so, so uh, jam-packed, like with so much info. I learn a lot from that. Yes. Read about yeah. sea buckthorn berry and hawthorn berry. Those are very, yeah. very, very, very good berries. People underestimate those. And, and the reason I recommend them now too is because nobody really consumes them. So you can get them really cheap still. Once once they take off, they'll be the next superfood. Hawthorn berry will be everywhere because hawthorn berry is very good for the blood, the brain, and raising superoxide dismutase levels. 
So it's a super cheap fruit that nobody consumes. That's the next power fruit. I, I take it every single day. Yeah, I, I even see some local trees sometimes during the season that the fruit um, actually is like ripe. I see it there. And sometimes I get the, I get them. <laughs> I, I get Good. them. Good. The yeah. Good, smart. Good man. Good man. Yeah. Eat them up. No, yeah. Like it's so cool because, you know, in the, in the like raw food world or in general, just like health. Uh, we focus on like specific things, but I feel like there's a lot missing that we don't focus on. And like, especially f things from the herbal world, we, we, uh, people kind of like make fun of the herbal world. Like, I, I think it's because, uh, there's like a lot of low quality herbs out there that don't really like actually work. Like a company could have like an herb that they're selling, but it could be like really shit quality. So of course it didn't work or of course it didn't help somebody. So, but, like, yeah, that's one of the worst. Matter of fact, you can go online right now. I recommend anybody to do it. Type in um, top five companies were caught selling ground up beans from Mexico as an <laughs> herb. So it wasn't actually even the herb that they were selling. So if you go to like to Walmart or Rite Aid or any of the mainstream places, most of the companies aren't even selling the herb that's on the label. So of course it's not going to work. It's a complete farce. And another thing that's set out is the pharmaceutical industry, even though they use herbs and still over 25% of pharmaceuticals, remember like aspirin comes from white willow bark. So of course it works. They know it works, but what they wanted to do is discredit herbalism because you can't patent white willow bark. There's no money to be made. So what they did is they came along and they said, we need to patent certain alkaloids that are found in the plants and then we can patent them. And then we can say that the herbs are garbage and ours is better. When in reality, it's the exact same thing. So they lied and now people believe that herbalism is weak and not true. When in reality, nothing is further from the truth. Our ancestors knew how powerful herbalism was a long time ago and we've gotten away from it. And then things like homeopathy came out, which were a total lie. And people associate homeopathy with herbalism. And they say, oh, look at that stupid er nonsense herbalist. It's, the, it's that woo-woo quackery stuff that doesn't do anything. Well, they've never studied it. That's the other problem. And here's the one thing that I like. I study everything, so I incorporate everything. I don't just look at diet. I don't just look at low glycemic foods. I don't just look at detox. I don't go, oh, it's just about antioxidants, or it's just about heavy metal detoxing, or it's just about parasite cleanse. No, no, no. Your body is about everything. Everything. I recommend everybody get like a test on their microbiome because what a blueberry that works for me actually might not work for you. Your microbiome might not like blueberries. Your microbiome might not like apples. You'd be very surprised. Your microbiome is very important. There's there's more of your microbiome than there are cells in your body. So you really need to look at some of the things that are actually going to be very good for you. And you're going to realize, oh, this is this is going to be really good to be a part of. And I really need to incorporate this system into my pro my program. I need to incorporate activated charcoal every so often because it's so good at getting toxins and debris out of my system. I don't need to do it every day of my life, but I definitely should be incorporating charcoal. When they threw charcoal into animal food, they were trying to kill them. They wanted to figure out what's the toxic level. So they put 50% of their diet with oats, with charcoal. Those animals lived 35% longer. Can you believe that? That's trying to kill them. That's how much longer they live. So charcoal is extraordinary for the body and extraordinary for a human being and all animals. Every single animal that they've tested with activated charcoal lived longer, not shorter, or even the same. They all live longer. I have a book called Biblical Longevity. And in it, you can find it on Amazon. It's only like $2.99. I try to make it as cheap as possible. And what it is, is it's, it's, it was meant to be in a, a PDF form. It was, it was meant to be in a Kindle form. So you can go through and you can click on the links. I mean, it's saturated in links. But just last week, I made it into a physical form for everybody. And uh, it's, gonna, it's, it's the first book where you can go through and you can say, I have breast cancer. And it's estrogen dominant. You can open it and it tells you the cure right there. I know I'm going to get into huge trouble for this, but I did it anyway. So anyway, it talks about all kinds. If you have HIV, you go to the section and you read and you're like, whoa, black seed oil. Here's what it does. Here's how it kills HIV. So you can just read through it. And in it is all the programs that I list. Like here's why to incorporate this herb and here's why. And you can pick and choose. You go through it and you put little check marks. Like I want to do that one. 
this one doesn't seem relevant. You just mark it off the list. But in reality, it's just it's everything that's in my mind, kind of like on paper. Like, why should I do this? How should I do that? What should I not do? If I'm going to do it, why? You know, like I recommend people not do plants or greens. In the book, I give you every reason why not to do it. So it's up to you to do it. You know what I mean? Like, I give reasons why and why not to and how. So it'll be fun. It's good. Awesome. All right. Well, I guess this is a good, uh, good place to end the, uh, the interview. So thank you, Matt, for coming on here with me. You gave sure. me a ton of information. Uh, I'm going to probably have to rewatch it, too, just to uh, download the info into my mind. And uh, a lot of people are going to en enjoy this as well. So thank you, Matt. Okay. Sounds there, good, man. I will, uh, I'll give you the link to the, my book for free to everybody because it's in a Google document form so they can open it up and just read it for free on your channel. How's that sound? And then um, I'm going to start doing some training again on video so you guys can actually start watching. I'm probably going to do some like demos on jujitsu. Like I did some weight training stuff, but it's hard to like find it, get excited on that. I, I like the martial arts thing. So I might do some more of that. You guys can actually watch my training. So you can see how intense it is. <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. No problem.